Good morning again. Um, I'd like to add my personal welcome. Uh, I speak for the entire Washington Army Law Review when I say that uh, it's truly a pleasure to host such an outstanding group of scholars and, and industry professionals. We, we recognize that you've all joined us here today because you care about how French lending products affect people's lives and uh, you've chosen to commit your time and, and energy to improving those products and we applaud you in your efforts and uh, are very, very proud to be able to provide a forum for you to present and um, debate your ideas uh, on these important issues. And this morning, it's my great honor, honor to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Professor Rock, Ronald Mann. Uh, professor Mann is currently a professor of law and the co-director for the Center of Transactional Studies at Columbia Law School. Before joining Columbia, he taught at the uh, University of Texas, where he was the Ben H. and Kitty King Powell Chair in Business and Commercial Law. Um, not only was Professor Mann a leading academic uh, at the University of Texas, but he also led his faculty student uh, dodgeball team to victory in the uh, 2006 <laughs> dodgeball tournament. And before his position at the University of Texas, uh, he was a professor at Michigan Law School and Washington University School of Law. Uh, professor Mann earned uh, his BA in history from Rice University in Houston, Texas, and his JD from uh, the University of Texas at Austin, where he graduated first in his class and was the managing editor of the Texas Law Review. Um, after law school, he was a, a law clerk for Joseph Sneed in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and for uh, Justice Lewis Powell, Jr. in the United States Supreme Court. Uh, after these uh, prestigious clerkships, Professor Mann uh, worked at Dow, Cogburn, and Friedman. He then spent two years at the Office of the Independent Counsel. Uh, before moving into academia, he served as the Assistant to the Solicitor General for the U.S. Department of Justice where he argued before the Supreme Court eight times and uh, wrote briefs on the merits in 40 Supreme Court cases. And Professor Mann continues his connection with the Supreme Court as a contributor to the SCOTUS blog, uh, where he blogs on Supreme Court cases in the area, areas of um, banking and intellectual property. Professor Mann has written extensively on, on many issues, including credit cards, uh, internet contracting, banking, and the role of patents in financing innovation. Several of Professor Mann's books and articles have been recognized with um, awards for, for his excellence. Um, his creative and insightful works have uh, set the course for scholarly debate on the issues about which he writes and on the issues that we're here today to discuss. Um, Professor Mann has written specifically about payday lending uh, in an article co-authored by Jim Hawkins. He considered payday loans by assessing the uh, economics of the market for these loans, including looking at uh, the business model, competitive structure, and the regulatory structure of the industry. Um, in considering payday lending from this broad perspective, Professors Mann and Hawkins noted that not all payday and French products um, are alike. The article identified specific areas uh, in the industry that are problematic, such as borrowers' habitual use of these products, lack of transparency, uh, ineffective disclosure schemes, and a lack of meaningful accountability for those lenders engaging in abusive practices. Um, the article suggested a way forward that would require more transparency and better disclosures, and that encouraged participation by, um, in the market by larger lenders uh, who may be able to more efficiently and uh, serve the market and may be less likely to engage in abusive practices. In a uh, 2007 symposium on consumer bankruptcy and credits in the wake of the 2005 bankruptcy reform law, Professor Mann proposed and proved that the main effect of this new law would be to facilitate credit card lending, um, the credit card lending business model of, of slowing the time of inevitable filing to earn greater revenues from distressed borrowers. Professor Mann uh, has also examined patterns of credit card use by low and moderate income households. His research had revealed that the predictors of credit card use in um, are different for low and moderate income households than for uh, the population at large. In the models he used, age, race, and education did not carry the predictive um, weight in low and moderate income households as it did for the general population. And he made the interesting finding that the, the level and existence of credit card debt for low and moderate income households was relatively unaffected uh, either by income or change in income level. Now recently, Professor Mann uh, with his wife and co-author Allison Mann, 
considered uh, contributions of debt and bankruptcy to life course mobility. This research revealed age and race-based variations in uh, bankrupt households that are consistent with the disparate racial access to markets and institutions and the increased incidence of financial activity among the elderly. Uh, these are just a few examples of the remarkable contributions that Professor Mann has made and is making to um, the areas of law that we're considering here today. We are uh, extremely grateful that Professor Mann has agreed to do some scheduling gymnastics in order to, to fit us in um, and join us for this symposium, and uh, we are truly honored to have his participation. So I'm certain you, like me, are, are anxious to hear from him, so uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Ronald Mann. Disappointment that we gave him that we were unwilling you know, or able, as the case may be, at that moment to commit to him that we would all teach either at the um, <coughs> University of Virginia, which was okay, <laughs> <laughs> or more preferably here. Um, as it happens, um, none of the four of us um, yet. Everything in the kitchen here, although three or four of us uh, did end up becoming um, professors of some sort. So um, it's, um, it, I've actually never been to Lexington before. I've driven through on the initiative. It's just a great pleasure to be here so close to uh, uh, Justice Powell's papers and the, the role that he had here. So, uh, uh, but my talk today, as it happens, has very little to do with Justice Powell. Uh, <laughs> Uh, when I uh, was thinking about this, and I'll say also, uh, I, I give this talk with some trepidation, recognizing the number of people in the audience that have worked in this area uh, a lot longer and with more care and intellectual rigor than the few things that I've written about. So I'm going to try carefully to cabin the subjects I've talked about today within sort of a narrow area that traces between the things that uh, so many of you know about more than me, and maybe I can say something that's not... Uh, completely wasted. I'm going to start with a strange thing that happened to me several months ago. I got this call um, asking me if I would talk about payday lending on a television program hosted by Jesse Jackson. Okay. Um, now, even if you listen to the introduction that she had, it will occur to you, those of you who've read much of my work, that uh, I'm not the logical person, I think, in a lot of ways, to uh, uh, sit next to Jesse Jackson on a television program. Uh, uh, so I've written about petty lending in the past, and the truth is, the things I've written have not condemned it entirely. And uh, so I assumed that the reason that they had called me was so that I could go out to Chicago to the television studio and 
I would say my piece, and then I would just be, you know, crushed beneath the uh, withering force of his personality and questioning, and and it would be like a great television show for him. <laughs> uh, I've seen Jesse Jackson talk, and he can turn, you know, he can turn a phrase, and I think he can can uh, crush people if he wishes to do so, and if they're in a situation where they can't really talk back effectively. And so I was reluctant to go do this. Um, the person that invited me happens to be here in the room, and she was there at the time. Uh, but I went to go, and, and as it turns out, uh, when the show was filmed, nothing could be further from the truth. It was, a, it was just this very strange experience, and I came back and talked about it to my wife. The things he wanted to talk about, the show starts off, what Jesse Jackson wants to know is, and he's angry, you sense the tone of anger, well, why aren't there any banks in our communities anymore? And his studio is in this place in Chicago, you know, distant from the parts of Chicago that I've previously been to, um, where it's, it's, it's in his part of Chicago. And, you know, there's no banks nearby. And, he, you know, why aren't there any banks here anymore? And, and um, the only people that are here are the petty lenders, and why does everybody hate them so much? Explain to me why they hate them so much. That's kind of a hard question to answer, to tell you the truth. And, and then finally, what do people in our communities need to know to use this product safely? And so the other people on the show were some legislators from Michigan who had adopted legislation that enabled payday loans. There was a financial literacy expert and uh, Jesse Jackson's son, who was kind of a policy uh, geek in a way. Um, and so ultimately, the purpose of the show was to help ease the way for payday lenders to thrive in these communities about which he cares so deeply. And so, you know, I thought about this incident over the months that followed, and I, uh, I became less and less surprised. And, and, and let me say a little bit about this. From the perspective of financial services, I think that the communities in, in these cities face really disheartening challenges, and, and, and the reasons are, are twofold. You know, on the one hand, their need for financial infrastructure has just grown markedly during this great never-ending recession. So there's millions of low- and moderate-income households that are underwater in their mortgages. There's millions of households that are just mired in long-term unemployment. There's millions of households that are underinsured, and they have rising health care costs that they can't pay. Education costs are rising much faster than inflation at a time when if you can't educate your children, you know that they're never going to succeed when they grow up. And then just to talk about data, because that's what I like to do when I can, although there will be very little of that today. We learned this week, the Census Bureau finally comes out with this supplemental poverty measure, and so we learned that if you actually look at it properly, there's millions more people in poverty than the number we've been counting for years, uh, mm -hmm. not thousands more, millions more. So that's what you have in the economy, desperate need for financial infrastructure. At the same time, Congress has been moving pretty briskly since the recession began to make it really hard for community banks and credit unions to serve these communities. And so uh, just to pick two examples that are salient to me, um, the Financial Stability Act in Dodd-Frank goes out of its way to say, uh, since it's so hard for financial institutions to get money to fund lending, why don't we differentially guarantee uh, obligations of the really big banks so that they can borrow money more cheaply than the small banks? Because we would like to make sure that the small banks and credit unions have a hard time staying alive. That's a good policy goal. Um, closer to home for me, the Durban Amendment has a similar effect by destabilizing the business model of these small banks. It makes it uh, much more, uh, uh, much lowers the revenues they can receive from debit cards. Well, since big banks, the price fixing that the Federal Reserve has established is about five times the level of their costs, it doesn't hurt the big banks so much because they can still make money on debit card products. But for small banks and credit unions, the prices are fixed and level where they lose money on every debit card transaction. So. This is another thing, it just makes it really hard for these people. So what we're going to see, just predictably, is more closing of branches in the communities where I was when I went to visit the Reverend Jackson. And so that's the framework out of which I want to talk about today. And so are the, are the people in these you know, LMI communities, I mean, do they lash out in the wrong direction and complain about bank closings? Are they crazy to, to 
welcome these alternative service providers that are coming in when the banks leave. And, and really, the, the specific thing I'm interested in is how should we think about regulating low and moderate income financial services in a post-recession environment? And I want to talk about this in two stages. So the first thing I want to do is talk about the regulatory strategy that we see, you know, largely from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, what we can expect from them. And after I sort of talk about that and, and how I see what they're going to do, I'm going to talk about two really fundamental flaws at the heart of what I think they're going to do. And the first one is this emphasis on solutions that are targeted at the problems of white middle class households. And the second one is the premise that the basic problem with financial services is in the market interface between the financial services firm and their customer as opposed to something broader about the financial situation of LMI households. So first part is the regulatory strategy. So if you're an academic, when you see the Consumer Financial Protection Act, in a lot of ways this is just a breath of fresh air, okay? The function and design of the agency draw directly on academic work from big time professors at important leading institutions. Uh, if you read the public statements of these academics that have selected these, the people who run the agency, Elizabeth Warren, Michael Barr, Orrin Bargill, Sandil Malanathan, all of these people suggest that this agency's regulatory strategy is going to be founded directly in academic work and behavioral economics. And so you have an agency that's going to do things based on academic work. So academics should be excited about this. Um, another thing going for this is if you're interested in the agency for more instrumental reasons, like you think we need to have more constraints on the providers of financial products, uh, picking behavioral economics is a great thing because this it has this really trendy cachet of it that it documents a, a really fundamental flaw in the rational actor model that has dominated legal scholarship for most of my career. Uh, which is that it, it turns out, not that surprisingly, if you look really carefully, most people, in fact, don't make fully rational decisions all the time. Just, just turns out, you look, that's not true. And indeed, if you look very carefully, ordinary people are just predictably irrational. And uh, for regulatory purposes, it's not just like, aha, all these rational actors people have been proven wrong. We should be glad to see that. It's more that the policy prescriptions that come from behavioral economics are just satisfying if you're seeking regulation because the policy perspective, if people act irrationally, then the government, at least in theory, can improve market outcomes by nudging all of the uh, individual actors toward better choices. And so this is just overtly paternalistic, but if we know that we're moving people toward rationality, well, it's not so hard to swallow the paternalistic aspects of it. So where this leads in the scholarship, uh, I think, is the selection of what's the proper lever for intervention. You have these people who write papers about asymmetric paternalism. We're going to limit the considered choices of a few that are just really bad choices to improve the reckless decision making of the large group of people who just don't know what they're doing. Now, if you read really carefully, you'll detect um, a somewhat troubling tone of insistence. If the consumers aren't going to make the right choices when they're nudged, well then we'll make the choices for them. And you see this in this famous paper by um, Elizabeth and Orrin Barr Gill. You know, they liken financial products to toasters. This is Elizabeth's big uh, uh, talking point. So, you know, if we don't let Sunbeam sell a toaster that's going to catch fire one out of a hundred times, why should we let Citibank sell a mortgage that's going to cause financial disaster for the homeowner one out of twenty times? And there's some truth to that. Um, but the undercurrent of it is, well, therefore, we're not going to let people buy the destructive mortgage. And you, you see how this plays out when you read uh, this paper by um, Michael Barr and Sindel Melanathan. And this is important for the agency because Melanathan is the director of the research unit at the CFPB. And Michael Barr has been really intimately involved in the legislation that founded it and, and in and, uh, the work setting it up, even though he's now back in Michigan. And so when they write this paper, what they're really worried about is how do we get homeowners to use fixed rate, fully amortizing mortgages? The mortgage that my parents had 
uh, when I grew up, the mortgage that I had when I bought my first house when I got out of law school. Uh, because that's really the product everybody should have because it's safe, okay? If you have a fixed rate, fully advertising mortgage, there's no risk that some balloon payments going to come due that you can't pay. There's no risk that the interest rate is going to jump up unexpectedly years from now. And, and so it's just a really safe product. It's like a great product. Um, and Michael and Cindy would really like to get people to choose that product as opposed to choosing these other uh, sophisticated, high-tech mortgage products that are more risky. And so they um, discuss in this paper, they've written a variety of sort of you know, tailored, ever and ever more onerous tools to get people to choose the right product. But the point of it is that they really want to impose pretty substantial transaction costs on people that choose the product that they think is the wrong product. And it's not that they're wrong to think it's a dangerous product. I mean, they're right that these are risks to people. But I think what they don't do, and I think it would be hard for the agency to do when they try to implement these kinds of rules, is to focus on the difference in market rates. The reason that uh, people, some people at least, choose these more exotic mortgage products is that they're a lot cheaper, okay? This is surreal right now, because right now all mortgage products that exist that you can get are incredibly cheap. But if there's ever a time in our country when there's an ordinary mortgage market and people are buying and selling houses and there's not millions of foreclosed houses shadowing over the market, eventually, if the markets ever restart, the spread between these products and go back again and fixed rate 30 year mortgages are going to be a lot more expensive than mortgages that have shorter terms and expose the lender to less interest rate and repayment risk. And I think that's the problem is if you use a really thick lever to force people to take the safe product, you deprive them of the ability to make the choice between the product that might work for them if they know they're only going to be in the house for three years and is a lot cheaper, and the really safe product that's important if they know they're going to live in their house for 30 years. And I think what they miss is the much lower likelihood that anybody of the current generation, you know, my children are never going to live in the same house for 30 years. Okay, I've not yet ever successfully lived in the same house for 10 years. Unlike my parents and my wife's parents who both live in the same house that they lived in when we started elementary school. That's just not going to be the life my kids live. And so I think that's the problem with, with this kind of pressure. So there's a similar initiative in credit card markets. I think it has the same thing. It, uh, there was a safe credit project at the, the Pew Institute that's the intellectual ancestor of the vanilla product authority you see in Dodd-Frank. And the idea is that if we could get banks to issue a safe, credit card, as the project was called, as a Pew or a standardized credit card product that the CFPB might design, well, the consumers, if they took the safe product, they wouldn't be exposed to the tricks and traps of the credit card lenders. But the problem, just the problem, I'm to uh, quote the Ferengi adage my kids like from Star Trek, which, which dates what I let my kids watch, is there's no profit in it. The business model of modern credit card lenders is founded on segmentation. I always retreat to talking about credit cards, no matter what I'm doing, because that's what I actually know something about. See, there's too many people who know about payday money, and I know credit cards, so I have to talk about that. The way credit cards work is the credit card lenders identify some very small group of the population. They design a product that's really attractive for them, like a product that's marketed for people that went to Washington and Lee. Okay. There's only one credit card for people to watch and Lee, and people went to watch and want that product. And if you really want that product because you love the fact that you went here, you don't care as much about the pricing, and it can be priced more aggressively because you're excited to have the credit card that has the w and logo on it. And the more standardized your product is, the more vanilla your product is, well, the more easily everybody else can copy it. And if anybody else can copy it, you're not going to have a comparative advantage. You can't price aggressively. You can't make very much money in it. And so it might be that the Bureau can get people to issue this little product. But the pricing they're going to put on is such that no one is going to pick that product as opposed to the segmented product that's targeted at them. Now, there's one other thing I should mention about the CFP, but while I'm still saying nice things about it, um, which is the emphasis on data and empirical work. Uh, behavioral economics. And it's hard. It's really an empirical subdiscipline. What you read in this field is scholars that conduct experiments designed to test the rationality of their subjects. 
and they write these papers that use econometric statistical techniques to prove that people are not totally rational. And uh, this is great if you don't like the highly theoretical modeling papers that prove exactly how fully rational people would balance their use of credit cards and checking accounts that bear no relation to what people actually do. Um, and when we take behavioralism into the policy arena, it's clear that the agency is going to have a strong data-driven flair. You, you see an example in um, the way the Federal Reserve has been doing disclosures under the Truth in Lending Act for the last few years since this became popular. Uh, when I first started teaching and writing case books, the disclosures that were required under the Truth in Lending Act were so complicated that you could you know, require your students to read them in class. And you know, law school students are smarter than the average bear. Um, and there's no student you can have that can read these disclosures and really understand what's going on. Because they were written by you know, lawyers at the Federal Reserve Board and the FTC who specialized in this area, and they were extremely precisely accurate. But there's no chance that any average consumer would get anything out of them, and the rational reaction would be just not to read them. But what they do now is they write these disclosures and they go out and they do field tests and focus groups and get the people who are going to read the disclosures to... Okay. Um, see if they understand. And so the issue of these new disclosures, you look at them and, you know, I could believe that my brother the works in the oil industry could read these disclosures, might actually read them and get something out of them. It's a huge change in what they're doing. And... Um, if you look at the report, one of the few things that the CFPB has actually done so far, they have this big report on remittances. And so, most of you probably have done a lot of work through remittances. I haven't. Um, but there's this new section of Dodd Frank that's added a big section of the EFTA that regulates remittance transfers. And this is important uh, because so many of the economies in places in Central America, for example, it's a big part of their. Uh, economic structure is the funds that get sent by remittance transfers from people in this country. It's important for me because the people in this country that send remittance transfers are, for the most part, you know, not wealthy. Um, and they're also not you know, well connected to the center part of society because they're not citizens, and the truth be told, um, they're often not legally present in this country. So these are not people that are the targets for lots of advertised products from Bank of America and Citibank. These are people who are going to alternative financial institutions. I think to this day, Western Union largely dominates this market. So the CFPB comes with this report, and this report is just really good. It does a lot of things that I think are, are just great. Um, the first thing it does, it recommends a simple, single price metric to compare all the various charges. And when you look at this first, it sounds a lot like some things you see in the Truth in Lending Act. But this all-in pricing, I think, is they, they take it much farther, because what they recognize is Telling consumers a comparison between the exchange rate for one provider and the exchange rate for another provider, that's just not interesting. The consumer doesn't care what the exchange rate is. And they don't care whether the exchange rate is five basis points higher or lower here or there. What they want to know is, if I give you $300 today, how much money is actually going to end up in Guatemala tomorrow? That's all they really care about. They just want, what's the highest amount of money that's going to go to Guatemala here, and what's the number? Can you tell me that number? And this report really emphasizes that. Um, another thing it does is it really focuses on how you might facilitate price competition. So it recommends uh, having these people post their all-in charges online so that people, before they actually go into stores, could compare prices at various providers and then go to the store that has the lowest price. Um, this is similar to provisions in the CARD Act that require credit card issuers to post their credit card agreements uh, Jim Hawkins has started a project looking at some of those. I think that kind of information is really useful. Another thing they do is they have a lot of discussion about how we might facilitate sending out the information on mobile phones and uh, uh, these types of channels that you know, are even beyond my uh, capability since I'm not the kind of person that could use a mobile phone to do that, but I'm sure that my children can, and presumably the people that are in this market can. So, all right, so that's the part I want to say that's positive. And so the real question is, what is it that I don't like about this agency? And 
what they're going to do. Um, there's really two things that I want to focus on. And they both share like this single problem, which is that I think that they, um, for a variety of reasons, have narrowed their focus in a way that really excludes much, if not most, of the things that they ought to be thinking about. Um, so let me start with the first one. Um, the first one, which is this idea, I think that they focus too much on the problems and circumstances of the white middle class households. So the starting point here is this idea that financial service providers use tricks and traps to ensnare consumers they give services to. And we see this pervasively in scholarship about consumer bankruptcy. You see this in uh, Oren Bargill's work. Um, it's very different from the consumer bankruptcy work because he's an economist. But like his best work shows really persuasively how market forces drive credit card issuers to design these products that seduce consumers by playing on these infra-rational tendencies they have. So let me explain why this is important to me. The first thing about it is it's this focus on middle class households. And so the consumer bankruptcy literature like much of the literature here, uh, really focuses on systems that are used by middle class households. Now part of this is, to some degree, subconscious. Um, not that many academics come from low and moderate income households. Not that many academics elite institutions are minorities. Not that many academics come, you know, most academics are from the Northeast and the ones that aren't from the Northeast are from the West Coast. There's very few that are from this big swath of the interior of the country where I grew up. Um, and so if their perspective is informed by personal experience, I mean, that's the personal experience that they have. And, um, but there's this more instrumental idea, which I think is what's really going on, which is what we know is that if you look at welfare reform, and there's a big sociological literature on this, when you design government institutions, if you design them for and target them at the middle class, and they seem like things for the middle class, they just have a lot more likelihood of long-term success and staying power than if they're designed and targeted for low and moderate income uh, 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 groups because then they face the potential of being marginalized as you know, you know, welfare transfers and the like. Uh, so, when we focus on this part of the market, it works well if we want to use what I would characterize as this classic neoliberal regulatory strategy that we're going to use paternalistic intervention to correct identifiable market imperfections because the strategy works really well if the people who are making the mistakes are people who are like the ones who are designing the rules because we know what counts as good decision making for the people that we understand and it's easier to intervene and correct their choices because we can understand the mistakes they're making. Um, but the problem is for the group of people that I care about, that I'm interested in studying, that are interested in me, low and moderate income households, the world is just so different that there's a disjunction between the regulatory frame and regulatory assumptions in the underlying financial activity. So if you step outside of the work that, you know, the legal academics who are at the core of designing these strategies have done, there's a lot of, of guidance. Now when I was writing this, I didn't know John Caskey was going to be here. Um, so it's hazardous to start saying this, but I was going to say um, that this book that John Caskey wrote about fringe banking is just like a perfect start. Um, so I guess I can still say it because he's sitting here. Because uh, what I took from this book when I read it, just to me, the most obvious reason that LMI households use pawn shops and check cashing stores instead of banks is that they're cheaper. Okay, it's not that they're stupid, it's well they're cheaper. They might use banks if banks were not more expensive for them than pawn shops and check cashing stores, but banks are expensive. And so, this sounds obvious, but it's really important for the regulatory strategy because a lot of the regulatory strategy rests on the idea that the reason that the poor make the choices they do is that they aren't smart enough to take care of their own money. And 
And um, it's a little bit of a caricature, but not much to say that a lot of the financial literacy scholarship, I'm not sure there's that many financial literacy people here, but uh, is that you know, if we could get the poor to come to seminars and, they, and so they'd really understand how compound interest works, well then they would be really smart and they would never use high cost financial products. And I just don't think that's, that just completely misses the reality of what these people have. Um, there's a lot of empirical literature now that sort of suggests that the households that use alternative financial strategies, in fact, in many ways, make relatively good choices about their money. So Stengel and Zimmerman have been doing these projects where they study how people balance their use and repayment on various credit card accounts that they have. And it turns out they do a really good job of balancing the payments among the various accounts. Um, they don't do as good a job about figuring out all the products that might be available to them, but among the products they have, they do a very good job of balancing inflows and outflows. Um, there's a paper by um, Adair Morse and um, Bertrand and a survey I'm working on that is sort of similar, which suggests that payday lending customers have a much better understanding than you would think of how they're going to use the product. Most of these people, in fact, expect that they're going to roll over their loans one way or another, and their estimates of how long they're going to continue to borrow are, are not all that far off. I'll know more about that in about six months, but um, it's, I don't think it's right to say that these people borrow because they have this unjustifiably optimistic view that in two weeks they're going to have a lot more money than they have now. I think that the reason they're choosing these products is because this is what makes sense to them and the place where they exist. And so to take it back to credit cards, because there's another set of papers people write where they ponder this idea of why do people use payday loans when they have outstanding lines on their credit cards, because there's lots of people that do that. Um, and I would suggest, and this is something I've suggested in the paper before, Payday loans are a lot easier to understand than credit cards. If you go into a payday lender and you borrow money from a payday lender, you might think it's expensive, but you pay the money today and it's gone. When you borrow money in a credit card, it's very hard to know how much money you're going to end up spending for the money that you've borrowed. And so I think about it, you know, how many of the people in this room that have credit cards in their wallet, and I've got a lot of credit cards in my wallet because I'm interested in this subject. Um, uh, I'm one of these people, I have a different, the way that I, budget my, keep track of my budget, I have a different credit card for every category of expenses. So I have a credit card that I use you know, only for expenses that I know for sure I'm going to get reimbursed by Columbia. And everything on that, I can assure my wife, it may look expensive, but it's not my problem. <laughs> uh, I have another credit card I use only for internet purchases because the number gets compromised like every three months and I can assume that this card is going to be replaced frequently. And so, I don't ever carry it in my wallet because of the likelihood of any given day that um, the card number will have been stolen and uh, it'll be bad. Um, and it's also just interesting because I keep track of the calls I get about the place that's being used. The last time I got stolen, somebody went into a Walmart in Central California one morning and bought like between $350 and $400 in goods at a Walmart in Central California every like three minutes for like three hours until the card got shut off. And they spent like $7,000 at this Walmart between you know, 1 and 3 in the morning one day before the card got shut off. And I have another credit card that I use in retail stores only, which that number I use lasts a really long time. That's the number my wife uses. She doesn't like the card numbers getting shut off. Um, <laughs> but the point is, you know, none of us really know how much we spend on a credit card. You know, how many of you know exactly which of the credit cards you all have annual fees and how much annual fees are? How many of you, you know, know, what are the rewards that offset the fee? Yeah, you do. You work at the Pew Institute. <laughs> you're, you're on the right tail of this. How, how, many, how many do you know exactly what the rewards on your cards and how much of that you're actually getting out of the rewards that offset the interest rates that make the product make sense? I mean, even you probably don't know that. And I'm guessing most of these people don't, and this is not a representative group of people. And if, if uh, the people in LMI households knew as little about the products they use as we know about the real all in cost of the credit cards, we would make fun of them and say, see, you people are really dumb. But I mean, it's just a point. I think they actually use products. They really know how much they're paying for these products. It may sound like a lot, but for them, they know what the price is. And they care about the amount they're spending, and they're spending the amount that they can see. And a related point um, on that is this 
like the risks of the of the product. I mean, the risk of entanglement of long-term borrowing for petty loans is obviously just less than credit cards. Um, and to the extent that it does exist, it has to do with this ability that they have to stack you know, multiple loans, which is kind of hard for the states to stamp out getting loans from multiple providers as long as you have internet providers out there that can sort of fly under the radar. Um, the other thing I think you have to focus on is that if you're um, in a constant state of financial terror, credit card lines are really viewed as an asset. And so there's this qualitative data that people have, have gotten that when you talk to these people, well, the, the $1,000 on my credit card, that's like a savings account because I can draw on that in an emergency. And so I'm going to go embark on a petty limit because that's like a short-term thing. But when I lose my job and I don't have a job, well, then I can't borrow from a petty lender. And God knows I couldn't borrow from a bank after I lost the job. But after I've lost my job and I've completely fallen off the cliff, Citibank won't know that's happened yet, so I can still spend $1,000 then. And so I save that for the real emergency, and that's why I'm going to go and I'm going to borrow something that's expensive when I can borrow money in a credit card, because a credit card is my last resort. Um, and then the last thing here is, um, people in LI, LMI households, I think they really don't like banks. And they have really good reasons for that. They don't think that banks are going to be fair. They don't think that the products that banks offer them are going to be transparent. They have this idea that there's going to be lots of fees that are hard to keep track of. Well, they're right. Um, I mean, the way that banks have gotten in the last 10 to 20 years, and this is a lot of what's been going on with the debit card interchange and the overdraft fees, is they can't depend simply on interest revenues from investing deposits. They can't depend just on interest revenues from credit card loans. The way that they can make the account system work has to be that they charge lots of little small fees that come in at various places that you don't expect. That's just the business model for banks that want to have accounts for consumers. Um, another thing I think that plays into this is people in LMA Health just don't like going into banks. They just think this is not a comfortable place for them to go culturally. I think the way to think about this is, is, is Walmart. Americans that aren't wealthy, they like buying things from Walmart. Um, they know what they're going to get, the quality will be okay, and the prices are going to be like so low you can't really understand how they can possibly do it. Um, you can't understand, you don't really want to think about it. Um, and so like there was a big story, I think, I forget which pair of the amazing Wall Street Journal about um, how successful Walmart's been, you know, cashing checks these days. Well, you know, they charge $3 to cash a check. Well, $3 is a lot to cash a check that's fairly small. It's a high percentage of it. And it's a lot to cash a check for me because the way I cash checks is I take a picture of them on my phone and it costs me nothing. But if you're in a household that doesn't want to go to a bank, you know, they have to think about, well, I could go to a bank and open a bank account, but first I have to go to a bank, and I hate that. And then if I go there and open an account, what's the likelihood that at the end of the day I'm really going to be able to cash checks for less than really $3 a check by the time I figure out what the bank charges me for having the account that won't have that much money in it, and then you know, I'll write too many checks, or I might use my debit card. or It's justifiable for people to just assume that the world will be worse if they go to a bank, and rather just go to Walmart and pay the $3. And so I just, this is where I'm supposed to talk about John Caskey again, I don't think it's changed all that much. I think it's rational for people in LMI households to just have an aversion to even exploring the products banks offer them. So even if we work on making the bank products cheaper, I just don't think that's going to get us anywhere. So that's my first criticism. So the, the general idea of the first point is I think that when people talk about the choices that, that uh, consumers make in their contracting, fixing those contracts so that they're perfect and so that people make perfect choices and they can fund those contracts is just not really looking at the problem. Because the problem is not really that there's contracting imperfections that can be repaired. The problem is that the people are poor. And so I think this faces up, this brings me to what I think is a more interesting point that perhaps has something of originality in it. And I think that what happens when we have a regulatory strategy that embraces behavioral economics, we're embracing behavioral economics because it gives us an excuse that's hard to disagree with 
to regulate something that we think is broken. Okay. We don't like what we see. Here's a easy, empirically validated, academically recorded reason for doing something about it. But the problem is that the implicit premise of what's broken is the same thing we've always had. The premise is what's broken is the contract to which the customer agrees. And so if we can only get them to choose the right products, then you know, everything will be fine. But that's just the wrong dichotomy, okay? That's saying that there's a dichotomy between these contracts that consumers agree to have to be efficient because they exist, okay? That's like the Cosian view. If the contract is there, it must be efficient or it wouldn't be there. As opposed to, well, the more modern view, well, because the contract exists, we know it's irrational because behaviorally challenged consumers chose it, so we know the contract is wrong. But the right dichotomy isn't between fixing the contract and not fixing it. It's between fixing the market in which consumers buy these products and figuring out how we can provide a set of market-supporting institutions so that the choices that are available to consumers make more sense for them. And so to put it another way, I, if... if uh, if you think that low and moderate income households would suffer financially, even if they were perfectly rational, then nothing about this behavioralist regulatory strategy is going to solve any of their problems. And I think that's the, the real effect of embracing this strategy is to divert the attention at a moment when we have a highly charged agency being created to divert their attention from real solutions to these problems to something that's really not going to help people all that much. So, in some ways this is where what I want to say just kind of falls apart, um, so I had to say, because most of the reasons that poor people have problems are not things I know anything about, right? So I can't help with education expenses. There's people here that can that are talking about this later today. I think that's what, so that's what Gene's talking about perhaps some. Um, healthcare problems, employment turnover, plumbing, real estate values. This is all, well, I can't get about that. Um, but I think there's a couple things I can still say that are worth talking about, which probably overlap with what I said before. Uh, the most important one is I think there's just this surreal perception of consumer budgeting. Um, when people analyze the economic rationality of payday borrowing, they treat these transactions as if there's a cycle of payday borrowing where there's a large loan at the beginning of the cycle and they save up, you read these papers, well if you saved up $3 a week you could repay the loan after 100 weeks and eventually you repaid and so if you look at the interest rate for this loan over the six month period until the free of the payday lender, this interest rate is much higher than the interest rate if they'd gone and gotten a short term loan from some bank or credit union and that would have made more sense for them. But I don't think that this reflects the reality of how people in financially challenged households make decisions. And so, and obviously this is all qualitative, just based on the interviews I've done mostly with financial providers of various kinds and sometimes with uh, uh, consumer advocate people who deal with them. I see much more of what people do is like almost every day you sort expenses that come based on the threat points that creditors have. So. What's going to happen if I don't pay this expense out of this paycheck? That's what people are thinking, not like what's the marginal interest rate. So is it worse to let my light bill go 60 days behind or let the credit card bill go 120 days behind? Well, clearly the answer is you should pay the light bill and not pay the credit card lender because the utility company might turn up the electricity and the credit card lender can't do anything except call you on the phone. Um, it might suggest you shouldn't pay your phone bill because once the phone gets turned off, the credit card lender can't do anything to you. Um, you know, or should I stop getting my car fixed, or should I go and borrow from the payday lender for the fourth consecutive pay period? Well, the answer is you got to repair the car because I'm going to get fired if I skip work again because my car's broken. And so, I think what's really going on is not that the customers can save up over six months to be free of the payday lender. I think the reality is they're going to stop borrowing from the payday lender for a whole pay period when the pay period passes when there's no emergency that's important enough to Trump spending $45 to get $300 in the next two weeks. It's just, there was no emergency this week, but when you're at the brink of financial distress, there's emergencies, most pay periods, and then you come to one that's not, and you're really happy. But there'll probably be another one two weeks later. So I think for me, 
This suggests a really different view of rollovers and repetitive borrowing. I don't think it's that useful to ask the sort of implicit question, should we stop these people from borrowing because they don't understand the interest rates they're paying? Because I think for a lot of these people, whatever the interest rates were, and if they were two or three times as high, the interest rates would still be dwarfed by the opportunity costs of what they would lose. So if we stop them borrowing, we're just going to drive them directly to that loss. Now, I think what that suggests is a sort of a harsher question. The reason to stop them from borrowing, if you want to stop them from borrowing, it's not because of the high cost. It's because you might think we'd all be better off if we stopped them from borrowing and just drove them off the financial cliff and got them to file for bankruptcy today. Okay, maybe the real question is, would they be better off if they were driven off the cliff, they filed for bankruptcy today instead of just struggling indefinitely to find this silver lining where they're going to pay off all their debts? And so to answer that question, you have to think about the trajectories that these borrowers face. They, they borrow repetitively for months. How many of these people eventually are just going to fail? How many of them are eventually going to recover? And how many of them are going to stay in this limbo for a really long time? And how do we feel about staying in that limbo? But they don't ever actually fail, but life is really hard. Um, and then the last question, I guess, on that is, if they do use bankruptcy and just uh, fall off a cliff, how much better would it get for them after that? I mean, these are kind of less pleasant questions. I think these are the questions you want to ask. And if you decided that all in all, you don't want to push them off the cliff right now because you think some are going to recover, well, then you might want to do something to make these products more accessible. If you want to drive them off the cliff, well, then, yeah, you're trying to figure out a way to make it really hard for them to borrow. But I don't think that's the same question as the one that we're asking. And so where does that lead you if you're thinking of this agency? Um, I'll say two things I think that it suggests to me. I think that uh, they should really try and think more creatively about ways to move outside this box of figuring out whether this particular product is like the toaster that's going to ignite. I think that, uh, you know, one central question is, uh, which we focused on since John Kessler writing about this, is do we want to, can we bring LMI households into mainstream financial institutions? And so we focus on how many of them have bank accounts, how many of them use the same products as middle class, and I'm just wonder if that's what we should be thinking about. If we accept the idea that they have you know, just a completely different set of constraints and needs than middle class households, and if it's so hard to figure out how banks can ever profit from serving them, maybe it would be better to foster a different set of institutions that serve the needs of different sets of households. And so, you know, it's, we always hear about how, you know, the poor pay more, and that's obviously true in a lot of ways. But the poor don't always pay more. And so I think about Walmart, I think about Walmart a lot. I have, um, Walmart serves a different demographic, dem different demographic than Target. But it's not served in a way where people that go to Walmart pay more than people who go to Target. It's because Walmart has a business model that's designed specifically for serving the people that want to come to Walmart. And it's not found on anything being expensive or anything being deceptive. And so maybe what would make more sense, instead of trying to figure out how to bring banks to households that don't really want to have banks, it would make more sense to try and figure out how to bring within sort of this tent of legitimacy financial service providers that want to serve low and moderate income households, and there's plenty of them out there that are trying to figure out how to do this, um, and try um, to sort of co-opt them to a mission of regulatory legitimacy instead of forcing them to the edge of illegality. And related to that, and this is, comes from this book by Bob Mayer, who I didn't know was going to be here either, um, why exactly do we have this regulatory model that forces short-term lending for really distressed people into this two-week petty model. The, the way it's set up now, the only loans that you can make that aren't subject to typical user limits are really tied to this roots and check cashing. It's a specific product that has a really high interest rate, a really short term, but there's nothing about the market except the legal rules that drive people to that particular product, which lots of people really hate. I mean, consumer advocates really hate this product, and, 
and I can see why. But it's it's um, I think the same lenders that do that product, I think they could profit on a product that had you know a longer term, you know, a few months instead of a few weeks. It had a lot lower interest rate because the transactional cost per month of outstanding loan will be lower, and so. I could imagine something like this Russell Sage initiative that's in Bob Mayer's book that was a century ago that led to these small loan laws where you could have a genuine collaboration among regulators and consumer advocates and lenders whose goal was, well, let's figure out how to do small loan lending at you know, low rates that would be practically profitable. We're not talking about profitable for banks. We're talking about practical for non-bank entities that want to be in this market, not that are trying to convince the regulators to satisfy the Community Reinvestment Act possibility if we don't really want to make money off of it. And I'm convinced that we could make this uh, work. It'd be much higher than usury ceilings are now, but um, I think it would work much better for these households than what we have now. So that's what I have to say. Yeah. <laughs>